thing, motion sickness. If you're familiar with her, um, she's a, she's a, she was an actor. She's an actress, na popular in the 90s, na sa Supergirl siya ngayon, but she uh, played Ali McBeal and she was known for her anorexia also. So, pwede may vomiting din with that. Um, very common in cancer, cancer drugs. Um, antibiotics, some can cause vomiting if you've taken, if you've waded in floodwaters and have taken doxycycline, um, you know na it's very. It's very harsh on the stomach. It can cause vomiting, pregnancy, uremia, ketoacidosis, liver failure, ethanol. So for the approach to the patient, um, when you have an acute na vomiting, like within the past day or few days, think of drugs. You ask them about everything they've ingested, na mga drugs, bisan herbal, bisan one tablet lang. Toxins, or have they ingested anything, um, any muriatic acid or silver jewelry cleaner or something, infections. Kung chronic, uh, maybe you're dealing with established diseases. Within minutes of meal consumption, maybe it's a rumination syndrome. If there's severe gastric emptying delays, uh, the vomitus may contain food residue ingested hours or days before. So if... Um, the, the patient's stomach does not move or there is something that, that is blocking the stomach, uh, the gastric outlet, then maybe you can find food there that was eaten three days ago. Parang ganun. So I'd like to ask number, number three. A 52-year-old male complains of postprandial vo bilos vomiting, bloatedness for around a week. So postprandial bilos vomiting number three, uh, bloatedness for a week. Uh, what differentials can you think of? Or can you can you guess as to where the 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 location of the pathology is? Number three, number three, are you here? Number three. Ada by number three. Wara ako nakikita na names kasi. Number three. Are you there? Or wala si number three? Sige, number nine na lang. Number nine, are you there? Uh, so, you have a 52-year-old male na may postprandial bilos vomiting, may bloatedness for a week. So, uh, if you're given that history, short history lang, kung postprandial na bilos vomiting, bloatedness for a week. No history of intake of medications, wala namang hospitalization or recent, no previous surgery. Um Obstruction, where's the obstruction? So intestines. Uh where in the intestines? Small bowel. Where in the small bowel? Do you know? Oh, so do you know because we if you recall, um, the bile comes from uh, the, um, the bile ducts, which opens into the ampulla of water in the second portion of the duodenum. So it means na um, patent pa up to the second portion of the duodenum. If it's lower than that, ileal or ileal na or nasa may cecums or large intestine, it will be a fecaloid na vomitus. So since walang feces mentioned, most likely it's higher up. So it's a it can be pwede siyang <clears throat> somewhere in the duodenum, um, probably D2 or D3 na uh, second portion or third portion of the duodenum na obstruction. So yun. So um, important points in the history, if you have hematinesis, so hematinesis is 
um, vomiting of blood. So this can, patients can tell you na uh, I vomited something na parang coffee or parang Milo. And uh, that's uh, that will point you to an etiology na galing sa chan or duodenum because the blood has already mixed with the gastric acid. And then malignancy or malarial wise tear, pwede rin. Feculent uh, MSA, so sometimes, although nakamas na kita tanan yan, um, it, uh, you can still smell the, the, the poop smell uh, of an NGT output uh, if, if it's really feculent. Tapos, that will uh, lead you to think of a distal intestinal or colonic obstruction. Bilos vomiting, um, you have to, it excludes gastric obstruction because the bile comes from you know, the second portion of the duodenum. So most likely the it's upper jejunal or lower duodenal na, na obstruction. Emesis of undigested food, so pwedeng zenkers diverticulum or akalasia. And then vomiting can relieve abdominal pain in bowel obstruction because the pressure is relieved but has no effect in pancreatitis or cholecystitis. Profound weight loss, so you always ask patients, um, did you lose weight? Or sometimes um, you ask them for pictures of themselves before. Or you can ask them if they had to change clothes or um, go down a size uh, ng clothing. Um, uh, for the past few months or weeks because of weight loss. Fever, which will suggest inflammation, headaches or visual feed changes, pwedeng intracranial sores, vertigo or tinnitus, pwedeng labyrinthine disease. Other helpful things in the PE, you have orthostatic hypotension and reduced skin turgor. It makes you think of intravascular loss. Uh, pulmonary abnormalities, um, <clears throat> Pulmonary abnormalities, um, pwedeng aspiration of vomitus. So when you aspirate, um, it usually goes to usually goes to the right lung because ang um, ano mas straight an aton bronchus na right. So usually nasa right. So for patients who have had a stroke or who are bedridden, tapos um, nagvomit nagvomit as nag pneumonia, you think of aspiration, absent bowel sounds, ileus or beginning obstruction, high pitch rushes, bowel obstruction, succussion splash. So, are you familiar? How do we elicit a succussion splash? Anyone? Na, nag, ano na baka mo? PE of the GI system. So, how, how do we elicit a succussion splash? Anyone? See number number thirty. Uh, how do we do a succussion splash? How do we? Uh, perform the physical exam pag succussion splash ang gusto nato i-elicit? Um, ascultating po the um, epigastrium and then rapidly tapping over it. Rapidly ano? Tapping po. Tap. Tapping? More of, um, so you put your your step um, over the epigastrium, and then you you kind of um, move the belly of the patient to elicit a splashing sound. Um, this will tell you that there is an obstruction kay diri nakaka dosad and ang um, um, what's this um, gastric content. So. If you, hopefully by next year, you will get to interact with patients more when we're all boosted and everyone's um, safe. So if you get the chance to have a G gastric outlet obstruction patient, you can try these uh, maneuvers. So uh, if there's tenderness or involuntary guarding, um, it makes you think of inflammation, fecal blood, um, will uh, will uh, 
the implication is mucosal injury from an ulcer, ischemia, or tumor, um, papilledema, visual field losses, then you think of something cranial, neoplasm, um, um, if you palpate a mass anywhere in the body, especially in the abdomen, or you have lymph adenopathies na in the in the cervical area or supraclavicular area. And then hypokalemia or metabolic acidosis. Um, if you're thinking of hypoke because of the persistent vomiting, you do electrolytes. Uh, iron deficiency anemia, you search for uh, mucosal injury. So if you have anemia and vomiting, um, the one of the common causes is, uh, is a mucosal injury like an ulcer or maybe a tumor in the upper or lower GI tract, pancreatobiliary disease, um, do pancreatic and liver biochemistry. So your uh, liver function test, your amylase lipase. Uh, if it's endo or ruma or paraneoplastic, do hormone or serologic abnormalities. Abdominal radiographs, um, you're familiar. Uh, we went through the, the radiograph last week with the uh, air fluid levels. And um, that, Kung may air fluid levels, that means you have IO or intestinal obstruction, pag ill use, diffusely dilated air fluid bowel loops, but wala namang air fluid le levels are significant. So if you have a patient in whom you're suspecting mesenteric ischemia, um, what diagnostic exam would you like to do? Number 70? Number 70? One seven, do. Ah, uh, asigay ka na lang one seven. <laughs> so, ah, uh, ikaw, ikaw na lang sige. Ah, uh, anong diagnostic exam for for mesenteric ischemia? <coughs> so, what would you like? Actually, there are many choices, uh, many options for um. Ah, yes, go lang. Barium swallow. Them. Barium swallow, it can it can provide you some information if you're uh, thinking of an upper gut. <clears throat> um, pwede siyang, in the case of mesenteric ischemia, um, less helpful siya. <clears throat> Any other test that you can think of? So try to recall a mesenteric ischemia is um, so there are vessels that are not able to to bring the appropriate blood to the appropriate amount of blood into the the areas of the intestine, um, leading to thickening ng intestine. Or sometimes necrosis ng intestine. Doppler ultrasound, doc. Ang Doppler ultrasound actually makakabulig here in a way because it will show you the thrombosed areas. Pwede naman. Other, other, other things that we can order. Um, mesenteric angiography po, Doc. Oh, pwede yung mesenteric angio. <clears throat> Available naman siya in our uh, higher centers in in Divine Word and I think in EBRMC. So you can do mesenteric angiography because it will highlight the the vasculature and it will show you which areas are blocked. So uh, diagnostics exam for partial bowel obstruction you can do an um, initial test would be the would be the x-ray and then other exams would include a CT scan or a small bowel barium radi radiography, colonic obstruction, um, a colonoscopy or contrast enema may be done. And then, uh, but a CT can also help intraperitoneal inflammation, ultrasound or CT, Crohn's disease, uh, C CT and MRI enterography, uh, intracranial disease. So you do a cranial CT, or MRI, ischemia, uh, mesenteric angiography, pwedeng CT scan, pwedeng MRI. Uh, motor disorders, uh, gastrointestinal motility testing, and then gastroparesis, you have gastric syntheticurphy, breath test, and wireless motility capsule methods. 
And then motor abnormalities, you have small intestinal manometry, <clears throat> uh, intestinal pseudo obstruction, you can do a barium transit and luminal dilatation on small bowel contrast radiography, or a CT scan will also do rumination syndrome, combined ambulatory esophageal pH impedance testing, and high resolution manometry. So for the therapy, so there are many causes as we went through the causes, maraming causes, so you direct it to the to the to the etiology. So hospitalization is considered is considered for severe dehydration. So if you have a patient na um, for example, GERD lang pala ang cause ng vomiting niya and she's, she's able to drink, she's not, she's able to take in food, very occasional lang ang vomiting, then maybe you don't need to hospitalize the patient. But if you are considering um, intestinal obstruction and the patient can't take in any, any form of nutrition, any liquid, then hospitalization is necessary. Once oral intake is tolerated, nutrients are restarted with low-fat liquids because lipids delay gastric emptying. So <clears throat> actually when you when you eat a fatty meal, um, mas, mas nagiiha ito ha, stomach mo mo. Foods high in indigestible residue are avoided because these prolong gastric retention. Controlling blood glucose and poorly controlled diabetics can reduce hospitalizations in gastroparesis. So if you have parents <clears throat> who have diabetes or relatives with diabetes, um, they can they can constantly complain of itong bloatedness na um, early satiety and um, controlling their blood sugars can greatly help with that. So here are uh, this is just um, a review of all the all the areas. So the humor is a trigger zone. Um, uh, which is stimulated by chemotherapy, anesthetics, and opioids. Um, these, uh, these meds, like histamine antagonists, muscarinic antagonists, dopamine antagonists, cannabinoids, can help uh, mitigate the vomiting. Um, 5-HT3 antagonists can also help when it comes to chemo, surgery, radiotherapy, thus benzodiazepines naman, um, pag memory, fear, anticipation ang nakaka-trigger ng vomiting. So, review this na lang kay madamo talaga. So, there's a uh, good table in Harrison's that helps you pick which, which treatment is appropriate. For example, um, you have patients na, na may gastroparesis. So, you can give domperidone, which is a peripheral antidopaminergic. Um, for example, you have a patient na may chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting uh, this is um, a prepitant is a option and also uh, the more common one is ondansetron and renisetron so um, knowing which part of the brain is stimulated will help you pick um, which drug to use so okay na yan. so this page uh, so uh, dysphagia uh, refers to difficulty swallowing and it refers to a problem with the transit of food or liquid from the mouth to the pharynx, at mouth to the hypopharynx or through the esophagus. Severe dysphagia can compromise nutrition, cause aspiration, and reduce the quality of life. So um, aphagia, so when you put the word a, ah, um, it means um, devoid of um, a political, so devoid of any political um, thoughts or inclinations, or um, yun. so aphasia, inability to swallow. Um, complete esophageal obstruction, mostly commonly encountered in the acute setting of a bowl, a foreign, uh, of a food bolus or foreign body in, impaction. So <clears throat> maybe you've heard of itong mga, we've seen in movies na they eat steak and then they cannot swallow na. So yun, they'll have aphasia if there's complete esophageal obstruction. Odynophagia, so uh, pag may odyno, it means painful. Um, so odynophagia, painful swallowing, typically because of an ulceration, and it's commonly accompanied by dysphagia. So you always ask the patient, makuri ba tumulon or masakit ba tumulon? So, 
ayun uh, globus pharyngeus is is something that patients will come to you for they feel like a foreign body sensation is in the neck that does not interfere with swallowing and sometimes you leave by swallowing so they feel na parang there's something stuck in their throat like a lump in their throat but they can actually swallow bisan mga mga sura but they just feel that there's something na nakakaulang there. Then transfer dysphagia frequently results in nasal regurgitation. So sometimes when you're drinking something and then um, it, uh, yun, in patients who, who drink, tapos nagkakaroon ng, the, their drink goes into their noses, then that's transfer dysphagia. Uh, phagophobia. So phobia is fear. So fear of swallowing or and refusal to swallow may be psychogenic or repeat the, or related to anticipatory anxiety about food bolus obstruction or dinophagia and aspiration. <clears throat> so this diagram uh, high, um, shows the shows the steps of swallowing. So swallowing begins with voluntary with a voluntary oral phase that includes preparation during which the food is masticated. So when we swallow, uh, when the food hits your mouth, you will chew it and then your food is masticated and mixed with saliva. This is followed by a transfer phase during which the bolus is pushed into the pharynx. Um, <clears throat> pharynx by the tongue. Bolus entry into the hypopharynx initiates the pharyngeal swallow response, which is centrally mediated and involves a complex series of actions, the net result of which is to propel food through the pharynx into, so from the pharynx into our, pharynx into our esophagus, while preventing its entry into the airway. So here, airway, esophagus. So there's a complex motion that protects the airway so that the food just goes purely into the esophagus. Uh, to, to accomplish this, the larynx is elevated and pulled forward, and that also facilitates upper esophageal sphincter opening. Tongue pulsion through, then propels the bolus through the upper esophageal sphincter, followed by a peristaltic contraction that clears residue from the pharynx through the esophagus. The lower esophageal sphincter relaxes, <laughs> relaxes as the food um, uh, food enters the esophagus and remains relaxed until the peristaltic contraction has delivered the bolus into the stomach. So peristaltic contractions elicited in response to a swallow are called primary peristalsis and involve sequence inhibition, inhibition followed by contraction of the musculature along the entire length of the esophagus. The inhibition that precedes peristaltic contraction is deglutitive inhibition. And then local distension of the esophagus anywhere along its length, uh, as may occur in GERD, activates secondary peristalsis that begins at the point of distension and proceeds distally. <clears throat> so there are a lot of complex uh, movements that, that allow us to swallow and uh, allow the food to move um, safely from our mouth into our pharynx, into our esophagus and down into our stomach. Musculature of the oral cavity, pharynx, upper esophageal sphincter, and cervical esophagus is striated and directly innervated by lower motor neurons carried in the cranial nerves. Oral cavity muscles are innervated by the fifth, seventh uh, uh, cranial nerves, the tongue by the twelfth hypoglossal cranial nerves. So if these cranial nerves are affected by a stroke, then, then swallowing is greatly affected. And pharyngeal muscles are innervated by the ninth and the 10th uh, vagus cranial nerves. Uh, the upper esophageal sphincter consists of the cricopharyngeus muscle, the adjacent inferior pharyngeal constrictor, and the proximal portion of the cervical esophagus. And vagus nerve ang nagi innervate. An innervation to the musculature actually acting on the upper esophageal sphincter to facilitate its opening during swallowing comes from the 5th, 7th, and 12th uh, cranial nerves. And opening uh, during swallowing involves both the cessation of vagal excitation to the cricopharyngeus muscle and um, Cricopharyngeus muscle and, and simultaneous contraction of the 
suprahyoid and genuhyoid muscles that pull open the upper esophageal sphincter in conjunction with the upward and forward displacement of the larynx. So this is uh, just a picture of our esophagus. So we have the cervical esophagus um, where the upper esophageal sphincter is, um, the thoracic esophagus um, where, where the aorta is uh, closely related and the abdominal esophagus. The neuromuscular apparatus for peristalsis is distinct in the proximal and the distal parts of the esophagus. The cervical esophagus, so this area, the, the first portion, the cervical esophagus, um, like the pharyngeal musculature, consists of striated muscle and is directly innervated by lower motor neurons of the vagus nerve. So peristalsis in the proximal esophagus is governed by sequential activation of the vagal motor neurons and the nucleus ambiguous. In contrast, the distal esophagus and the lower esophageal sphincter are composed of smooth muscle naman, not striated, and are controlled by excitatory and inhibitory neurons within the esophageal myenteric plexus. Uh, medullary preganglionic neurons from the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus trigger peristalsis via these uh, ganglionic neurons during primary peristalsis. Sige, types of dysphagia. So, question and answer naman. Um, so anyone can answer. So I just like to see how you would ask patients. So I have, so I'm a 40, for example, I'm a 40, 40 year old female coming in with dysphagia. Mm, there are many causes of dysphagia also, as, as you may think. So what are some of the questions you would like to ask this patient? 40 female complaining of dysphagia. So how would you approach this patient? Sige, anyone lang. So what are the important questions you would like to ask a patient na 40 coming in with dysphagia? So anyone? Ask about appetite, doc. Appetite, yes. So you ask if um, poor bang appetite niya or oh, na affect ba niya appetite with the dysphagia? Okay. Um, any other questions you would like to ask so that you can you can you can rule out the other causes of dysphagia? Food preferences. Oh, uh, so actually the food that's a good question because um, they will prefer the the type of food that can go through. So they'll say na puro na lang ako luga, puro na lang ako gatas. So Take note of those things because it will, and then you ask, um, kung kaya ba nilang kumaon ng mga sura, ng luto, ng karne, and they'll say na um, it's hard to swallow. So those are things that could point to certain types, uh, certain etiologies of this phagia. Other things that you would like to ask? Actually, oh, counting slides naman lang. So food preferences, appetite, anything else that you would like to ask that could help us um, elucidate on the type of dysphagia and the etiology of the dysphagia? Location, doc. Location. So um, how would you ask it, itong location? Per sakto location, location, location. So you could, so there are some people who can feel na didi pa lang sa um, lalamunan or sa throat pa lang, sa neck area pa lang, they feel na hindi na nakakalusot or some feel it in the chest. So that can also help you uh, decipher. So there are many types of dysphagia. So there, you can uh, differentiate it as structural or propulsive dysphagia. For structural dysphagia, this can be caused by an oversized bolus or a narrow lumen. So either too big ang food or too small ang lumen. Propulsive or motor dysphagia is due to abnormalities in peristalsis because our nervous system governs um, uh, peristalsis or impaired sphincter relaxation after. Types of dysphagia you can have, or the first type is... Um, 
oropharyngeal dysphagia. So this is associated with poor bolus formation and control so that the food has prolonged retention in the oral cavity and may seep out of the mouth. So sometimes our patients, especially our neuro patients, when they eat the food, they feel like it's slipping from the sides of their mouth. There's drooling and difficulty in initiating swallowing. Poor bolus control also may lead to premature spillage of food into the hypopharynx, resulting in aspiration uh, into the trachea and regurgitation into the nasal cavity, so ang transfer dysphagia. Pharyngeal phase dysphagia is associated with retention of food in the pharynx due to poor tongue or pharyngeal propulsion or obstruction at the upper esophageal sphincter. Signs and symptoms of concomitant hoarseness or cranial nerve dysfunction. So those are things that we should also ask. If there's hoarseness, then there's laryngeal involvement, uh, laryngotracheal involvement, and cranial nerve dysfunction. It means that but there are so many cranial nerves that govern the swallowing. So pwedeng, um, if there are other, other signs of cranial nerve dysfunction, then you can think of oropharyngeal dysphagia. Usually it's caused by neurologic, muscular, structural, iatrogenic, infectious, and metabolic causes. And iatrogenic, neurologic, and structural patho pathologies are most common. So iatrogenic, this is caused by surgery or radiation, especially in head and neck cancer. Neurogenic, pwedeng from strokes, Parkinson's, ALS, and then medullary nuclear directly innervate the oropharynx. Lateralization of the pharyngeal dysphagia implies either a structural pharyngeal lesion or a neurologic process. So here, um, this is a barium swallow that shows ito, this uh, indentation um, na nagpapakita ng Ano, Zenger's diverticulum. And rapid sequence, uh, sequence fluoroscopy is necessary to evaluate for functional abnormalities. Ad adequate fluoroscopic examination requires that the patient is conscious and cooperative because he is um, advised to swallow. The study incorporates recordings of swallow sequences during ingestion of food and liquids of varied consistencies. And structural abnormalities of the oropharynx, especially those which require biopsies, should be um, assessed with direct laryngoscopic examination para you can do your biopsies. So the esophagus is around 18 to 26 cm in length and divided into the cervical esophagus and the thoracic esophagus, which continues into the diaphragmatic hiatus. And um, esophageal dysphagia naman, um, solid food dysphagia becomes common when the lumen is very narrow. So um, with solid food with solid food dysphagia, if it's very narrow, the yun mga karne cannot push, um, cannot be swallowed. Um, usually, if it's less than thirteen millimeters, um, that's when you start having solid food dysphagia. But this can also occur with larger diameters in the setting of poorly masticated food or motor dysfunction. Circumferential lesions are more likely to cause dysphagia then are lesions that involve only a partial circumference. So when you say circumferential lesions, parang mga donut type, parang the whole, the whole um, lumen is, um, the whole, um, the lumen is uh, covered circumferentially talaga as is the case with strictures or um, masses. The most common structural cause for dysphagia are scatsis rings, eosinophilic esophagitis, and peptic strictures. Dysphagia also occurs in the setting of GERD without a stricture because uh, perhaps on the basis of altered esophageal sensation, disability, or motor function. And then uh, propulsive disorders uh, leading to this type of dysphagia results from abnormalities in peristalsis. And the clinical manifestations usually are dominated by oropharyngeal dysphagia. Diseases affecting smooth muscle involve both the thoracic esophagus and the LES. A dominant manifestation of this is absent peristalsis and uh, referring to either the complete absence of swallow-induced contractions or the presence of non-peristaltic uh, disordered contractions. So absent peristalsis or the failure of the glutative LES relaxation are the defining features of achalasia. So the lower, you have the upper esophageal sphincter and the lower esophageal sphincter. The lower esophageal sphincter is supposed to relax once the food is already in that area, in the lower esophagus. In achalasia, 
um, it does not um, relax. So it's, it remains closed and then um, so the food cannot go down and this creates a lot of pressure in the esophagus. This enlarges the esophagus. So that's what happens in Achalasia. In diffuse esophageal spas spasm, LES function is normal with the disordered motility restricted to the esophageal body. Absent peristalsis combined with severe weakness of the LES is a nonspecific pattern commonly found in scleroderma. So approach to the patient. So um, if you have a patient with dysphagia, so first you ask, is the dysphagia localized to the neck? Na if there's nasal regurgitation, there's aspiration, associated ENT symptoms, if there's drooling, then you're dealing with oropharyngeal dysphagia. So is it structural or propulsive? Um, if it's structural, think of all this. If it's propulsive, um, it can be neurogenic or myogenic. So pwedeng nag-stroke, nag-Parkinson's. If it's myogenic, think of myasthenia gravis. So you look at the whole patient. Does the patient have other symptoms of MG? And then... Um, it can be sarcoidosis. But uh, if the patient complains of dysphagia localized to the chest or neck with food impaction, there's no drooling, there's no nasal regurgitation, no aspiration, no hoarseness, think of esophageal dysphagia. If it's a purely solid dysphagia, think of structural causes, um, a ring, a web, a neoplasm, a stricture, a hiatal hernia, if you have odinophagia, so if you have painful swallowing, think of pill esophagitis. So this can happen with calcium pills, with ferrous, with doxycycline, even with azithromycin, caustic injury, chemotherapy. So kung esophageal dysphagia na solid and liquid, it can be from propulsive dysphagia from GERD, achalasia, BS, or scleroderma. So last question na lang. May time pa. Um, a 25-year-old male with a history of muriatic acid ingestion in June 2021 comes to you with dysphagia. Uh, what differentials can you think of and what, the, what diagnostics should we do? Number 48. So muriatic acid Ingestion with oropharyngeal dysphagia. Um, yun. A few months after nag ingestion ng muriatic acid, number 48. What differentials can you think of and what diagnostics would you like to do? Number 48, are you there? Number 48, absent. Hello? Or number 45? Number 45? And just see number 45. Number 45. Or number, ano ba? Class secretary na lang. And just yung class secretary. Oh, oh. Sige. So, okay, wala ang mga numbers. So, you have a 25 male, 25 year old male with a history of muriatic acid intake in June 20, 2021. May dysphagia siya, uh, na oropharyngeal. What differentials can you think of? So we can take a look at the so esophageal dysphagia, my history of 
um, muriatic acid ingestion, per nabuhay siya. So what what could be the possible cause ng ng esophageal dysphagia niya? Gastric perforation. Perforation. Kung perforation, you would um, mostly in the acute uh, acute phase of the ingestion yun. So, June siya nag-ingest, came to you yan na December. So, medyo uh, low likelihood ng, ng perforation. With perforation, he would com come to you with abdominal, with severe abdominal pain. So what other complications can you get if you drank muriatic acid? So muriatic acid can can scar can scar your uh, GI tract, and with scarring, what can, what happens when you have scarring ng GI tract? You'll have fibrosis, maninig a. What can happen to the GI tract? Okay, So, yun, or oropharyngeal dysphagia na, na solid dysphagia daw. So, oropharyngeal, so solid dysphagia uh, without odynophagia. So, it's somewhere here. So kung yun, the muriatic acid, pwede manigan ang esophagus or ang stomach. So it's not as smooth as before. So it can create mga narrow wings. So what would you call those mga narrow wings na sa esophagus after intake of, after ingestion of muriatic acid? Corrosive esophagus stricture. Also, pwede, you can have strictures. So, the diagnostic for strictures, um, yun. Uh, you can do an endoscopy pa rin, uh, but the endoscopy can only, di ba, endoscopy, with, in an endoscopy, you have a hose with a camera, uh, camera and light source at the end. So once you reach the stricture, you might, might not be able to go through. So it's good uh, to do an endoscopy just to see the mucosal, how the mucosa looks like. You can take biopsies for certain, certain causes. But um, so for that case, you can do an initial uh, EGD and then you can follow it up with a barium radiography. So with the barium radiograph radiography, you will ingest... Um, contrast and this contrast can trickle down into the stricture and it will show you how long the stricture is, kung kaya ba siya i-dilate or operahan. Again, so good. So that's the that's the use of the barium radiography, radiography for a case like strictures. If you have oropharyngeal dysphagia, you do a fluoroscopic swallow study, auto, auto laryngo and neurology evaluation, esophageal dysphagia, EGD, Motility disorders, EGD, then uh, manometry, and then yun, strictures barium radio, pwede you have EGD initial CT, and then EUS, endoscopic uh, ultrasound, can help you in certain causes for dysphagia. For the treatment, it depends on both the locus and specific etiology. So, for example, with oropharyngeal dysphagia, it's from, in a, from Parkinson's or myasthenia gravis, then you will treat the underlying disease. As, and then, um, so it really depends on the etiology. Aspiration risk may be reduced by altering the consistency of ingested food or liquid. So in patients with stroke, sometimes it's harder to, to manage liquid, kay mas slippery ang liquid. So you can give something like thickeners to thicken the liquid so that it's, solid, it's more solid and it can be easily swallowed. And then... Surgical intervention for certain cases lang uh, with cricopharyngeal myotomy is not usually helpful with the exception of specific disorders like 
idiopathic uh, cricopharyngeal bars, enters diverticulum, and oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy. And then Parkinson's disease, ALS, you, you will treat the underlying disease. Uh, feeding by NGT or an endoscopically placed uh, gastrostomy tube may be considered for nutritional support. Um, but still, these, these, these uh, maneuver, these um, interventions do not protect uh, uh, the patient 100% from aspiration. So, yun lang. Okay. Sige. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Pudok. Thank you. Thank you.